University of Berkeley, and I'm one of the co-organizers of our, our um, Bad Math Day today. I want to introduce my co-organizers, who are Chris Ur, um, Isabel Shankar, Marielle Supina, Foster Tom, and Jessica De Silva. So if you have a question throughout the day today, please just message one of us over Zoom and we will get right back to you. So welcome to, Bad, to Bay Area Discrete Math Day or maybe more affectionately called Bad Math Day. I'm really, really glad to see you all today. And I'm so happy that we can still connect with each other over Zoom, even though we can't see each other in person. <laughs> I would like to argue that it's a very fortunate acronym. <laughs> so um, the silver lining of today is that we are less bound by geography. So I'd like to thank all of you who have come from beyond the Bay Area to visit us today. I'm so excited to meet all of you. Before we begin, I want to thank everyone who made this day possible. So first of all, I would like to thank the Simons Institute at UC Berkeley for hosting us today in their Zoom room and later um, the Gather Town, which I will describe a little bit soon. I would like to specifically thank Jesse and Darren who are managing all of the tech today for us. So thank you so much for making this all possible. I would also like to thank the speakers for sharing your work with us today. And I'd really like to thank all of you for coming. I'm so excited that you're all here to make this community possible. So before we get started, I wanna get a little bit into the logistics. So the schedule will be posted in the chat by one of my good friends shortly. We will be on Zoom during the talks and the coffee breaks. The talks will be recorded by the Simons Institute during the talking portion. And then the last 10 minutes of each of those talking times will be devoted to questions and the question period will not be recorded. So I'm very excited for all of the discussion that will happen during those times. During the lunch break, um, we will be using Gather Town, which I think you have all received an email from the Simons Institute that has a link from the Gather Town, but we will also be reposting the link in the chat when it's time. So Gather Town is a website where you can actually walk around and the Simons Institute has created a beautiful reconstruction of the actual Simons Institute. So it'll almost be like we're there and you can walk around and play games. And when you're near people, you can talk to them. So you can kind of mingle like you would in real life. We will also have the Gather Town open during um, after the conference. So if you would like to mingle post 3.30, you are welcome to use the Gather Town to do so. So I would like to thank all of you again for coming. And um, shortly, I will introduce the first speaker. All right, I'm so excited to introduce our first speaker today, um, Kat Perry from the Soka University of America. And she is giving a talk called Breaking Symmetries, Distinguishing Mycelskian Graphs. So th let's thank our first speaker. Thank you so much, Kat. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, yeah, so this is uh, breaking symmetries in graphs, uh, and specifically, uh, we're going to do this by looking at a class of graphs called uh, Michelskian graphs. So 
that this can be done with any graphs. And that's part of why I wanted to talk about it today. There are a lot of open problems here. Um, okay. And yeah, so I should say that this uh, it's kind of an ongoing collaboration, and it was started at a Women in Graph Theory workshop at um, the Institute for uh, Mathematics and its Applications uh, a couple Augusts ago for the pandemic. Um, and so these are uh, my co-authors, so Deborah, Sally, Lauren, Sarah, and Puck. And also, uh, just so, yeah, I am at Sophie University, which is an hour uh, north of San Diego in Orange County. So I am not in the Bay Area, but I am in California. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm playing around with the Zoom on my end to get everyone's pictures in the right spot. But okay, one thing I should say too, if you have a question, I'm fine if you just ask it during the talk. Um, okay, uh, so uh, if I wanna study symmetry in a graph, how do I go about doing that? And there are many ways, uh, but in particular, we can look at the automorphisms uh, of the vertices in a graph. And so we'll say, uh, right, this is a permutation of the vertices of G, such that the resulting graph is isomorphic to G. And uh, if we wanna talk about how symmetric a graph is, uh, one thing we can do is we can look at just the possible automorphisms in G, how many are there, something like that. Uh, but another way to do this uh, is to color the vertices of the graph uh, and then see, um, yeah, if I want to preserve the color classes, um, kind of how many vertices do I need to color so that the trivial automorphism is the only one that can do this? Okay. And so, um, yeah, again, many ways to study symmetry. This is one of the ways that we investigated. And so, uh, yeah, so I want to look at an example. So here's C8, and I want to color this with two colors. And then my question is, um, if I, yeah, are there, are there automorphisms that preserve the color classes that are not trivial? And I'm asking all of you. <laughs> There's one, isn't there? If you kind of flip the, flip it horizontally. Uh, ver vertically, right? Or about uh, this. Yeah, yeah. For, I like yeah. You move it horizontally across the vertical axis. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah. And point B, there. There is one. Right. There. There is this kind of reflection that we can do. Okay. So. Um, all right. Uh, but what about this? Same thing. Now I have two orange vertices. Uh, are there still automorphisms that aren't trivial? You could still reflect or rotate. Yeah, uh, I can flip, yeah. Can I rotate? I, if I want the two orange vertices to remain orange then and the blue ones to remain blue, then I think I can just flip. Yes, okay. Okay, um, all right. So next question, I promise I'm not just gonna ask questions the whole talk. Um, if I say I want to color this with two colors and I want the only automorphism that preserves the orange vertices and the blue vertices um, to be the trivial one, can, how many more orange vertices do I need to add or how many? Yeah, how many? Yeah. You can add one at the four o'clock maybe. Yes, perfect. This one, right? Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. And so, right. And so if I do this, um, now I have, I've colored this graph with two colors and the only automorphism that is gonna fix the color class is the trivial automorphism. Okay? And so this is what we're trying to do. And then the question is uh, here, at least if I wanna use two colors, how many orange, uh, how many orange vertices did I need to use? 
Um, and so, okay, can I, could I have done this with two orange vertices? Is it just unfortunate that me putting them together um, kind of slowed us down or do I need three? With two, you can always slip, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, on this graph, yeah, exactly. Uh, right, so I do need three. Uh, okay, new and I believe last question. Uh, what if I, okay, so let's go back. So pretend that there are no colors here. Um, and I can use, I can color with any color. So I don't have to use just two. I can use three, four, five. Um, what's the minimum number of vertices that I can have not be blue? And then I can kind of freeze this. So the only automorphism will be the trivial one. Probably two, like red and green right next to each other. Perfect, yeah. Okay, I did not email you my slides ahead of time, but yeah, th yeah, this is exactly right. Um, but yeah, orange and green. Yeah, and so if I have these, uh, this coloring, by having one orange vertex and one green vertex, I am effectively fixing those vertices in place. So they are pinned down and I can't move them and then therefore I can't move anything else, okay. Uh, and so um, there are sort of two ways to do what I'm talking about. So I can kind of say, all right, let me minimize the number of colors, AKA the orange vertices. How many do I need? Um, but, or instead let me minimize the number of vertices that are gonna not have this big color, coloring color class. Um, all right, and so um, I'm gonna say that a graph is de-distinguishable. If there's a coloring of the vertices with D colors, so that only the trivial automorphism preserves the color classes. And then we are gonna prioritize minimizing D. Okay, so in this case, I want the orange and blue coloring, not the orange, blue, and green coloring. Okay, so I wanna say, yeah, I'm looking for how many colors do I need in order to do this? And I don't care how many get the second color class, any of that, okay. And so for this, uh, yeah, I'd say the distinguishing number of C8 is two, because I can do this with two colors. Okay. Uh, all right. And so uh, this was introduced by Albertson and Collins in 1996. And one quick observation I'll say is that the distinguishing number is one, if and only if the graph has no symmetry. Okay. And uh, something else that is worth pointing out too is that different graphs with the same automorphism group might have different distinguishing numbers, okay? So it's not just enough to know the automorphism group. And in fact, right, we don't know the automorphism group for every single class of graphs. Okay. And here are some examples uh, just of kind of common classes of graphs and their distinguishing numbers. And uh, something I do want to point out here is that for many of them, the distinguishing number is two, okay? And so right away we realize that uh, we do, and this kind of, this continues with many classes of graphs. And so we do get this sort of large class of distinguishing number two. And so, um, <clears throat> yes, and okay, so that's just this observation and here's kind of some more classes. And so this sort of led to the question, well, within this very large class of graphs, can I distinguish between the members of that class? And so that led um, Wilfred Emmerich to pose this question in response to uh, this, about, and this is Deborah, one of the, my co-authors, defined uh, what's said to be the cost of two distinguishing, which it basically says, okay, I can do this with two colors, but what's the minimum number of vertices that need to be in the second color class. And so we'll say that this is the cost of two distinguishing. And so here again, um, I have this, I have C8. Um, I know that if I color this with two colors, then the only automorphism that preserves the color classes is the trivial automorphism. And like we talked about, I need to color at least three vertices orange. And so we'll say that the cost of two distinguishing this graph is three. Uh, okay, any questions? 
I can, I know a lot of people are jumping in the room right now. Okay. Um, all right. And so uh, one thing that's also interesting to point out is that as soon as we switch to investigating the costs, uh, a lot of times we are able to just find bounds. Okay. So it's not like with C8, we could say, okay, it's too distinguishable and the cost is three. Uh, but oftentimes that's not the case. We, you know, we set this bound and say, okay, the cost is at least this or between this and things like that. Um, and so if you get one thing from my talk, I want it to be this. There are many open problems concerning finding the distinguishing number or the cost of two distinguishing various classes of graphs and even just relaxing this parameter, looking at uh, the thing that we, the second kind of example where I had the uh, orange and green vertex, anything related to that, there are a lot of open questions here. Okay. Um, all right, but uh, what did I do specifically or what did uh, we do right ahead of a group of people? Um, and so we investigated this parameter on a class of graphs. And so this is the Michelskian construction. And this was first introduced in 1955 uh, with the goal of taking a graph, uh, K2, and then performing this construction and uh, maintaining this property of being triangle free and then having a larger chromatic number. Okay. And um, so uh, that's uh, what we did. Uh, so I will say, um, yeah, I think this construction is, it's a bit nasty, um, but it's, I, I'll, I'll do it with a picture, but basically I'm gonna take a graph, I'm gonna copy all of the vertices and I'm gonna use the first graph to sort of dictate where the edges fall uh, in this sort of graph with twice as many vertices. And then I'm gonna add a dominating vertex, uh, which is called the shadow master, but it's also often called the blue vertex. Uh, okay. Uh, so let's say this graph on my left is the original graph. And notice it doesn't have to be connected. And actually, uh, the isolate, if a graph has isolated vertices, they end up being quite important uh, with this sort of thing. Um, okay, so I take this graph uh, and then I'm going to copy all of the vertices that it has. And then what I'm gonna do is, so I'll use these to represent, I'll say the original vertices. And then each vertex has a shadow. The use will be shadow vertices. And so notice V1 is connected to V2. And so I'm gonna have V1 and I'm gonna connect it to U2. Okay, so the shadow of its neighbor. And similarly, V2 is connected to, U, to V1. So I'll connect it to U1. And I'll just continue this process. And so what you'll notice is that the copy, the orange vertices, uh, which are orange so that we can tell them apart, not because they have a distinguishing coloring on them, um, they won't have any edges between them. Okay? They're just going to be have these edges that are two sort of these original blue vertices. Uh, and so what you'll see is that the degree of the original vertices doubles. And then the degree of the shadow vertices, the orange ones is the same as in the original graph, okay? And then the last step is to add this vertex W of root, and then W uh, is adjacent to all of the shadow vertices. Okay, so it's a lot, uh, but yeah, but one thing you can see, I guess, hopefully, yeah, so remember, um, the goal, right, is to maintain this property of being triangle free, but sort of by adding in this W vertex, then if I were trying to actually vertex color this graph, W would need a different color than what all of these shadows have. And so that's the motivation for the construction. Okay. Um, all right. And so formally, what's going on is it's this, uh, but I will kind of spare us all the definition since we saw the picture. And then um, one thing that I do wanna point out, so this is the Michelskian of uh, K13. And this, you can see that this graph has a lot of symmetry, right? So I have this reflection that I can do 
And then um, these sort of um, the leaves of the stars right here, we see them and they're kind of, they have the same neighborhood, right? So they're twin vertices. And so I have automorphisms that are exchanging them too. And it does turn out that these uh, Michelskians of the star graphs are kind of worst case scenario for what we're trying to do with adding colors to the vertices so that we're sort of preventing automorphisms from being possible. Okay, uh, but just like anything with math, right? You never stop at one, one thing. So you ask kind of, how can I take this further? How can I generalize this? What else can I do? And so there is, there are actually multiple sort of variations of uh, this uh, Michalski and construction. One is to just uh, take a graph, perform this construction, get a new graph, perform that, perform the construction again as if that one was the original and so on, uh, which is what Michalski did. But this is slightly different where instead of having just one layer of shadows, I have as many as I want. So this superscript T is going to tell me how many shadows I have. And again, I think it is just easier to look at a picture. And what I want to do is kind of call everyone's attention to this graph that's in the upper right hand corner, which is uh, kind of the second um, iteration, or I guess this kind of uh, generalized Michelle skin with two levels of shadows. And if you look at the orange vertices, then you'll notice they behave just like the ones, the orange ones in the previous example, right? They're kind of connected to the neighbors uh, of their original vertex counterparts. Uh, but then they also have that, they have edges that go one level below and also one level above. And that's sort of, but with the same sort of rule dictating this. And that's the same idea, right? So for the generalized Michelle scans, you can have as many layers of shadows as you want. Um, and then their edges are just going to go above and below. Okay, so now instead of having, um, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, okay, questions on that? Yeah, so just clarification, the going from left to right, you're just adding more copies of the original graph instead of doubling each time, is that right? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I'm, yes, yes. I'm adding more copies, and then I am keeping track of sort of what number of copy it is. Mm -hmm. So like, and then I have sort of these levels, like level one, level yeah. two, level three, and then the edges go up, up one and below one. Yeah, okay, good, sounds good. Okay, perfect. And then, yeah, the last observation too is that this white vertex here is the root vertex W and it is just adjacent to the top level of shadow vertices. Yep, okay. great. Okay, and um, all right. And so uh, what did we do? Um, and so this is, we answered a conjecture by uh, Alakani and Sultani who said that uh, interestingly, uh, maybe, uh, that the distinguishing number of the uh, Michelskian of a graph is less than or equal to the distinguishing number of that graph. Okay, so not the generalized Michelskian, just the regular one uh, with this section of a finite number. <clears throat> and uh, so effectively, this is saying if I do this construction, then it's going to decrease the symmetry. Okay. And uh, here's our result. So we originally did start with just looking at their conjecture, but then we said, oh, actually there's this class of generalized Michelski and graphs and it follows closely enough so we can do it for this too. Um, and so, yeah, the thing to point out here is that um, this TL, can people see my mouse on here? Okay, perfect, yeah, so this TL, um, yeah, so if, if I have an isolated vertex in my original graph, uh, if I just perform this Michelski construction once, like we saw, then I still just have one isolated vertex because its shadow is connected to the root W. Uh, but if I am doing this generalized Michelski N, then I have a lot of isolated vertices because they all are isolated except for the very last one. And so you can imagine if I have a graph with 10 isolated vertices to start with, then this number just explodes. And so um, 
if I want to uh, put a distinguishing coloring on my graph, then all the isolated vertices need different colors because otherwise I have these automorphisms where I can just switch them very easily. So they're, they're twin vertices, even though they don't have neighbors. Um, and so that kind of becomes a big deal, but we can say, if I don't have too many isolated vertices, then in fact, their conjecture is true. And not only is it true for um, the Michelskian of a graph, it's true if I do this generalized Michelskian construction. So no matter kind of how crazy things get, um, I can still take a distinguishing coloring from my original graph and I can do some things and I can effectively use it to put a distinguishing number or a distinguishing coloring on this kind of much crazier uh, generalized Michelskian graph. And um, okay, so very quickly, um, I will just, I'm just going to outline what we did. Um, the main thing is that uh, we kind of looked at some facts about automorphisms. What do they do? Uh, kind of what things are fixed. And then um, we have this really nice lemma that basically says um, the star graphs are the ones that are bad and everything else is going to at least fix this root vertex. And so if I know that the W root vertex is fixed, then that tells me that the levels of all of the shadows are fixed. And then that ended up being a big help. Um, and then we also had this observation too that I'll continue um, about twins from the beginning. Uh, so I can interchange twins, right? So they have the same neighbors. And so if I want a distinguishing coloring, then they need to be different colors. And so, uh, yeah, we just took those observations and then we took a coloring from the original graph and extended it. And so um, again, picture. So here's my original graph. Um, here's Chelskian. If I want to do this again, I would have even more vertices. You can see I just they're they're kind of in this blob, right? Um, but we can we we all know where the edges are. Um, and then I take this coloring from my original graph, and then I'm just going to use as much of it as I can on my generalized Chelskian. And so for one, first I need all the isolated vertices. They just have to have different colors. Uh, but after that, I can reuse colors. And so the question in the proof becomes, can, is this enough to allow me to do this? And in fact it is. So I can, uh, these sort of shadows of my original isolated vertices, I can give them the same colors as in the original graph. And then actually I can do the same thing here. So I have two orange vertices. And so if I've done this construction twice, then I'll, each will have four shadows. Uh, and so I have six vertices that are orange. And so uh, kind of if I have an original vertex and it has one color, um, as long as it's not this star graph originally, then I can have its shadows all have the same color. And so that's this tactic behind the scenes. And then um, here the, um, isolated vertices did sort of take over and were powerful enough that that said, okay, this is the number of colors I'm going to need. And then I can just do the rest. If I hadn't had them, then I really could have just taken this coloring here and stretched it over here. Um, and then it, so then I, that's how we got our less than or equal to, right? Maybe it is less than, maybe this wasn't best possible, but this is certainly worst possible. Um, and yeah, and then, uh, okay, future work. Uh, like we talked about, right? I can look at other classes of graphs and I can also take distinguishing and I can look at it with other parameters. Um, but also, so this idea of having twins ended up being a huge deal, right? Um, but what else is a huge deal? Um, or what other things just, what other properties of the graph could affect this parameter? And then also sort of relaxations um, or distinguishing colorings, uh, like we saw, right, with more than the minimum number of colors. Um, or what also what if I'm what if I'm not just doing this with two colors, uh, then can I, you know, what can I do with the cost like that? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let's thank the speaker.